Good afternoon to everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, good afternoon. Yeah. Okay, good afternoon. Welcome back to our lesson. And uh, well, I realize I understand that I'm the only one who's groomed because I'm the only one who is on in video. And um, I'll be sending you at the end of the, of the class another uh another indication of how one can get ready for for zoom meetings but uh, i'll send that at the end of the of the class i trust you all well and that uh, now we're going to sort of go ahead with our uh, module devoted to a uh, well the welfare state and uh, <clears throat> What I'm going to, if you remember, we uh, we left last. Uh, sorry, just one second. Just let me go back to the close this, and let me go back to the share screen okay now one second i must still get the slides on sorry every now and then confused there we have the slides One second, just please give me one. Yes, here we are. Just let me try to understand why. Can you see the slides now? Yes. Okay, that's fine. So last last week we were looking at uh, mm, at how to uh, how one somehow pays for all these. Uh, uh, social services, and we've seen that uh, um, taxation is uh, uh, one the main uh, the main uh, source of, uh, of um, income for the of revenue for the state. And um, uh, what? Just just let me go one second back. Um, Here we are. So the sources of financial resources, sale of goods of assets belonging to the states, typically natural resources, oil, gas, metal. Now this is quite common in, in someone has their microphone on. Can you please close it? Um, consider, that, as I've already mentioned, that there are uh, some countries, typically the um, Arabian uh, countries of the Arabian Peninsula, Saudi Arabia, and uh, uh, the um, uh, Persian Gulf states, which have natural resources, but also uh, Russia, and coming much more near to us, obviously uh, Norway, which has the North Sea gas. Then we have taxes, and then we have uh, public debt. And we're going to insist, I'm going to insist particularly on the issue of public debt as a financial resource. Uh, so when we look at taxes, now, this I don't want to anticipate what you will have to study in your uh, taxation um, law and tax law classes. Uh, just to remind you that if we, as lawyers, we don't understand anything about taxes, we well, we we're not we're 
we're not fit for the job. You must understand, as taxes are everywhere, if we don't understand anything about taxes, we, we, it's difficult for us to, uh, to advise, to understand, to counsel, uh, to direct, and even to make our personal choices. So if we look at uh, taxes, the main distinction is between direct taxes, which are paid uh, directly to the state, typically income taxes, land taxes, personal property taxes, and indirect taxes, which instead are paid in relation to uh, production, distribution, consumption of goods and services. Typically, VAT, value-added tax, excises on petrol. Uh, so these are typical uh, taxes which are indirect and which are when you go, you buy anything uh, in, a, in a shop, you always see that the price is, uh, let's say it's 100, uh, it's so 1 euro and then they're 22, in Italy at least, it's 22% of that and so it's 122. So just to point out that, that these are indirect, uh, these are indirect uh, taxes. Now, generally, uh, direct taxes are progressive. What does progressive mean? That the higher the income or the wealth, because they can be taxes are, as we have seen, uh, direct taxes are on income taxes and personal property taxes. Uh, well, also land taxes, but they are generally set and not so much progressive, but uh, direct taxes are generally progressive. That means the higher the income or the wealth, the higher the tax rate. So it's a very low income. There might be no, uh, no uh, taxes to pay. And then gradually with the, with the, um, uh, with the um, increase of income, uh, we see that the, uh, the the tax rate increases. And this also when the, the wealth, if it's a tax which is uh, applied on the uh, total wealth of the, of the individual. Uh, so this has a redistributive effect. What does this mean? That if the richer you are, or you're supposed to be, the more you're paying, and therefore what you're paying obviously doesn't come back to you in the form of, uh, of social services, well, obviously, partly they will come, but if you pay a lot for in taxes, it isn't that you get more uh, health uh, services, more educational services, or more infrastructural services. If someone who is very rich is uh, ill, that person will receive from the uh, social uh, service the same kind of treatment that anybody else that receives even if that other person has spent, uh, has paid very little taxes. So you see this is as redistribution. So those who earn more or have more redistribute, redistribute through their taxes a uh, certain amount of social services to people who have less. While generally indirect taxes are generally constant. Uh, so this means that if I'm very rich or I'm very poor, my value-added tax on whatever product I'm buying, I'm buying a pair of jeans, that will be always the same. It doesn't change. So what does this mean? That they weigh much more on lower income consumers. You can imagine that someone who has low income um, spends most of his or her income in consumption, and therefore uh, it, uh, the uh, indirect taxes are more have more weight on the income. Twenty cents for someone who is very rich means nothing. For someone who has a very low pension, just think of a pensioner who uh, has a pension of 800 euros, you realize that 20 cents here, 20 cents there, and you pass these through the whole days and so on, well, it starts becoming pretty, pretty expensive. So um, it, it has much more incidence on the, on the overall income of this person. So just to point out that when we start uh, applying taxes, we have, we're doing, political choice, political in the proper sense, 
I mean, we have a, there's, there's a policy behind that. And what are the redistributive effects of, uh, of uh, uh, taxes? What kind of taxes you want to apply and where you get, where the state gets most of its, uh, of its uh, uh, revenue. Now, um, what is, uh, I would like to point out that this issue is, uh, I've mentioned uh, some of the political aspects, the fact that in Magna Carta and then the English Bill of Rights of 1689, there's control of parliament over the, over the um, uh, taxation by the sovereign. And then we've seen it in the US system, the fact that uh, the, uh, the, the how the whole the taxation issue, the principle of no taxation without representation was one of the uh, reasons of the uh, American Revolution and how in the American Constitution, particularly when we look at Article 1, the powers of, uh, of, par of uh, Congress, we see that this is a a uh, substantial constitutional issue. But we also find in more recent constitutions that the principle of progressivity, the fact that, um, that taxes are progressive and therefore the more you earn or the more you uh, have, the more the higher the tax rate are established in constitution. Sometimes it's expressly written in constitution that taxes are progressive. So this means that you cannot have a system different, a taxation system, which is not uh, progressive. Now this is a very important because it means that the state can not choose, cannot change its uh, uh, taxation system, but must, from a constitutional point of view, must remain within the idea of, uh, a, prog uh, of a progressive taxation system. So, uh, obviously, if you put... Uh, excuse me, sir, but I, I think someone has still his um, microphone on and it's quite disturbing while listening to you. Yes. Okay, can can everybody please mute their... Thank you, Anzalone. Can everybody mute them? them? One second, just let me send a message to everybody. Let's try to to everybody, to everybody. Thank you. Okay. So um, now this is this is very important because uh, this means when it is there's a constitutional provision uh, which establishes that uh, um, that um, um, taxation must be progressive. This has uh, not only it is a constitutional principle, but this means that uh, uh, well the the state can. Uh, does not have very much uh, flexibility in choosing what kind of, uh, uh, of taxation system he wants to adopt. It can has a little bit of flexibility, but not much. But uh, so depends, this is, as you see, if it's written in the constitution, this has uh, significant legal, political, and, and social effects. Now, uh, just to point out that this is not only an issue of, uh, um, of looking at one's own system, whether you're looking at the British system, you're looking at the Belgium system or the Italian system, it has to do also with comparing legal systems. And in, uh, uh, when we look 
at um, sort of compare legal systems, though among those who compare legal systems from a very practical point of view are taxation lawyers. They to understand whether it is more or less convenient to open a certain activity in a country, you look obviously at uh, um, at uh, um, at the taxation system and how much taxes you are paying or you're supposed to pay in a country rather than a different country. I've already mentioned this from when we were looking at company law, how um, uh, sort of some countries attract um, uh, attract companies uh, because of the company law they have. And I mentioned the case of the Netherlands, which attracted uh, first Fiat Chrysler, and now probably they're going to attract also Mediaset. Um, the whole idea is also the idea of taxation. How much do companies um, uh, pay for um, for uh, in for taxes, and so uh, we see that uh, uh, the comparison between taxation models <clears throat> is very important from a business point of view to understand what activity is convenient or not convenient to invest in, what where to establish its fiscal headquarters. Uh, uh, tax havens. I just would like to remember just for our Italian students, it's tax haven. Haven in English means a port. And anybody who has studied a little bit of, of, of German knows that half in, in German means a port uh, and not heaven, because in Italian it's translated as tax heavens, but it's not heavens, it's tax havens which are false. Just to point out that there are sometimes some mistakes when uh, certain uh, words in English are transposed in languages which are not uh, in other languages. And then we see that other countries are very strong uh, function of attracting investments. Luxembourg, for example, is very good at attracting investment funds. They pay very little money in Luxembourg and we find them all concentrated in Luxembourg. Ireland instead has been very active in attracting high-tech companies. If you look at Facebook and Google, they are, have their headquarters are in Ireland and not in other uh, European uh, countries. Why? Because they don't pay, uh, pay much uh, taxes. And so the fact is that you use fiscal policies and tax rates in order to attract investments. And this is why we're interested in comparing. I mean, this is a very, a very material way of comparison. We are not looking at the best of the worlds uh, possible, but we are trying to understand, the company is trying to understand where it's going to pay less taxes. Now, this is quite reasonable. Companies may make a profit. It has shareholders and it must satisfy its shareholders. If it goes in a country where it pays lots of taxes, the shareholders tend to be unsatisfied and will say, no, we're not going to invest in this company. If we have some money, we're going to put our money to someone else. If I have 1,000 euros to invest in a company, I will put that money in a company which has which will give me the highest dividend. But if this dividend is reaped by uh, ta very high taxation, I see no convenience. I'll put my 1,000 euro where it is more convenient. And this is a very rational behavior, economic behavior, which is behavior of the company, but also of investors. Small investors, big investors, go and look for uh, some kind of remuneration for their investment. Otherwise, they, they say, well, no use investing, we might as well spend it. So just to point out that this is not, when we look at the comparison of taxation systems, it's not something that is uh, uh, theoretical or philosophical. It is a very practical aspect, which is decisive in uh, the management of, of uh, companies and of business. Now, uh, just to, uh, I've mentioned some countries 
progressive taxation is in the constitution, so you cannot do anything else but um, uh, apply progressive taxation. That is, the higher the income, the higher the, uh, the wealth, uh, well, the higher the tax rate. However, there are um, this strong push and application in many countries of so-called flat rates. The tax rate is not progressive and therefore encourages maximization of profits. So just let's imagine that there's a tax rate mostly between 15 and 25 percent. It is a flat rate and whatever you earn, you're going to pay, well, 15 or 25 percent. Let's imagine 25 percent it maximum so it's a flat rate so what happens if you pay uh, if you earn one euro you will pay 25 cents this taxes are mostly for companies if this company uh, earns 1 million euros it will pay always 25 percent if he earns 100 million euros it will always pay 25 percent so it's not progressive it is flat now what is the rationale behind flat taxes, which I repeat, are mostly applied to companies, not so much to personal individual um, wealth and income. And it has the encourages maximization of profits. You say, well, Adam, if I, it is true that I have a 25%, but this is 25% in taxes, is much uh, much better than paying 40% or 50% in taxes. I have much more profit and therefore my, my shareholders are much more satisfied. When I have to invest, I have lots of money that I can invest. I don't have to find other ways of finding money. So you see that from a very economic point of view, if we look how companies run, and a company is always looking for money, how to make more money to, for new investments and for wants to purchase and uh, we've seen the issue of mergers and acquisitions. You want to buy a new company because you think that would bring more profit. Uh, well, uh, flat taxes are very attractive. We see that in um, in some uh, Baltic states in the European Union, Latvia and Lithuania, they have flat taxes. Russia uh, has flat taxes um, for companies. And in the US, some of the US states, not obviously we're not talking of the, um, of the federal US, but single states where companies are based, they, have, they pay taxes there. So if you apply a flat tax, company is has the has the interest of establishing itself in that state rather than a different state of the uh, US and uh, uh, what is said is that if you read a literature on the topic there are obviously positive aspects and negative aspects both from an economic and from a social and political point of view it, it is not obviously as many aspects in this uh, in our contemporary lives nothing is all black or white there are somehow positive aspects and negative aspects what is the negative aspect which is uh, which is uh, uh, put against uh, flat taxes that they have a reflect regressive uh, effect that is that the less wealthy pay for the more wealthy. Someone has been writing, doing some drawing. Okay, uh, we can have also some artistic. We can have an artistic break at a certain point. Um, we have so the the chat. What is the accusation against flat taxes? It is a system by which those who have um, uh, more taxes, who have more income pay less taxes and those who have less income pay more taxes. So it's just to show, show that there are a certain amount of uh, um, negative aspects of uh, uh, against uh, flat taxes, although it regularly comes up uh, whether 
in, in countries where taxes are very high taxes, whether we are talking of, let's take three countries which are very similar from a taxation point of view, Italy, France, and Spain, well, this comes up regularly, the idea of putting flat taxes on, on, uh, on companies. However, uh, uh, this is at ultimately, um, this is a choice of voters. Voters in a democracy, is, remember, we are talking of advanced uh, economic uh, democratic systems. So we're looking at Western economic uh, democratic systems. So we're not looking at other countries which we could look, for example, at Japan, which is a democracy but is not Western. Let's look at only Western. That means, well, North Americas and Europe. Let's look at that and obviously uh, New Zealand and Australia. Let's look at these countries. Well, voters decide what they want. I mean, they are free to choose and they can prefer having uh, uh, more income by paying less taxes or having more social services by paying more taxes. We shall see this when we are looking at social services and the comparison between the US and the European Union. Why in one uh, uh, side of the Atlantic people prefer paying less taxes and but have less social services and this side of the Atlantic people prefer voters, first of all, prefer paying more taxes and, uh, and receiving more social services. We shall see this in a moment. Uh, mm, so just to keep in mind, the sources of revenue for a state, the state must spend a whole lot of money for, um, for uh, social services and generally for the administration. They come from natural resources. If you have natural resources, they come from taxes or they come from um, public debt. Now, public debt has always existed. Uh, we know that, I mean, since ancient times, any um, states, empires, sovereigns were, um, were um, asking, lending, were borrowing money from uh, somewhere, from other countries, from banks and so on. Uh, if anybody of you is familiar with, uh, with Genoa uh, and has ever been there and has seen the wonderful palaces that are there and how the, the town has all these uh, villas and palaces and so on, well, that's mostly uh, mostly the result of uh, the, the, uh, the Genoese bankers who are lending money to the Spanish kings. This seems very strange that the Spanish kings who are full of gold coming from, from Latin America needed money, but uh, Genoese bankers managed to, uh, to lend money to the, to the Spanish kings and made in the fortune, and that is the fortune of their time. So public debt has always existed. Uh, let's look at, uh, but generally, uh, we wasn't really considered as a factor in public finance. He said, well, you borrow money, there are bonds, and, you know, there was a war to be made, and then there were treasury bonds sold, but this was not really considered. What happens is, and this happens uh, with the, really with the, after the First World War, we see that there's this great English um, economist, John Maynard Keynes, and this is Keynes' is a big name that we should remember because he has had very lasting influence on, uh, on not only economic thought, but also political thought. I mean, these times of crisis, the whole idea, Keynes, his ideas came, come out very often. So um, Keynes, while until sort of the First World War, the whole idea was that, you know, the 
public debt should be as low as possible and you shouldn't make too much public debt and that the, uh, the balance of the of the state should always be uh, the budget should always be balanced uh, and so you wouldn't uh, uh, you wouldn't do um, there would be not there wouldn't be public debt if you didn't have for example you didn't have gold to repay that uh, public debt uh, Keynes uh, after the especially after the 1929 uh, dramatic economic crisis the Wall Street crash and the economic crisis that hit the US and Europe um, indicated that public debt was the policy instrument to uh, overcome economic crisis. That is public expenditure. The state starts spending money. As the state does not have uh, money, let's imagine a typical, a typical um, situation like now. Uh, the economy is stopped. There's nobody is doing business or very few people are doing business and very few people are paying, paying taxes. So the state has no money. How is the state going to overcome this crisis? If it were, uh, this is just to, um, sorry, just let's see if I can uh, write, here we are. So a pro-cyclic uh, approach is uh, the behavior of the state that as it has very little money, it starts saying, well, I don't have money and therefore I will not spend money. I, I can't do as any family does. You don't have money and so you start saving, you start, you start cutting on your expenditures are. Um, Sorry, I have a message from Baker. Just let me see. Okay. Hope we've solved our problem with connections with London and hope um, uh, Baker Wood can listen to us. So, in the pro cyclic approach, is a very rational approach. Just like in this situation, a family has a uh, has a certain income and says, "Well, I we can't we this we don't have enough money. We'll reduce our expenditures." Now, what has what is the effect of this? If the state does not spend money, obviously this means that it will not. People don't have jobs. Don't mm, people don't sell to the state, and therefore the people the even less taxes will be made and. Therefore, the state will be winding up in an even uh, harsher crisis. One the approach, the Keynes approach, was uh, anti-cyclic approach. So when there's an economic crisis, just like now, the state should spend, should spend, should spend, because the only way in which we will go out of the economic crisis in which we are living now is because the state is spending. How will the state spend? By doing public debt. So now this is, I'm just saying that this, what we are living today is a, is a story that we've seen several other times. We've seen it in the in the dramatic depression of the 1930s. We've seen it after World War II. The fact of using public debt, um, uh, public debt, as a way to somehow to favor the economic uh, development and the fact that the, uh, an economic recovery. Uh, so just to point out that now this issue, which is a typical issue of public finance, and this is why I insist that our 
uh, Italian students should when next year they have be very careful when they study uh, public finance, which is a compulsory um, uh, course in, uh, in Italian, in at least at the Roma Tre. Um, what, is the, what is the issue? What is the problem? Is that public debt now is the, uh, the most common way through which uh, the state, the government pays expenses. Whatever these expenses are, I mean, they, in normal times, we find certain countries that have a very high public debt. Think of a very rich country like the US, where does, what is their uh, main source of, uh, of expenditure? The military. Obviously, the US is a, is a uh, power, a superpower in the world. It has very strong uh, army, navy, uh, aviation, it's atomic, uh, uh, um, nuclear uh, weapons, it has space exploration and so on, and therefore it spends an enormous amount of money in uh, the in and for the military. So, um, just to point out, just to make some examples uh, of how certain countries use uh, public debt to uh, pay government expenses. Uh, Greece, which uh, underwent a dramatic uh, um, uh, financial crisis around uh, five, six years ago, is, has 179% of its uh, uh, gross domestic um, uh, product is, uh, that is debt. So if we look at the yearly uh, domestic product, and we see that the debt that um, Greece has is 179 of its uh, of its uh, uh, GDP. Italy is 132. US is 107. And then we look at this happy country, which is Switzerland, which is 30 percent of the GDP. Why? Because uh, Switzerland has uh, uh, traditionally an enormous amount of gold reserves, and therefore has been able somehow to manage quite well its, uh, its, uh, public, um, uh, its public debt and uh, having good taxation system, everybody pays uh, taxes, pays quite a lot of taxes and therefore everything is somehow covered. It's also a small country, you should consider this and which, with not all those many differences between the various parts of Switzerland. Now, what is the uh, these are economic aspects, but again, I would like to insist, economic aspects cannot be, uh, not, cannot, you cannot separate them from political and from legal aspects and constitutional aspects. What do we have? We have seen that in many countries, and this in many countries includes in Europe, uh, Germany, Italy, Poland, have a so-called balanced budget provision. What is a balanced budget provision? This means that when every year there's a budget which is voted by parliament and which says what are the expenses, the expenditures that the state, the government will do the following year, each expenditure must be covered or by taxes, revenue, taxes, so you put more taxes and nobody's happy of putting, putting new taxes because clearly someone will be very will complain about this or issue public debt. Just think of a very simple, um, uh, something that happens regularly, but I'll mention it because maybe someone remembers this. Uh, at uh, the last budget session in Italy, uh, there, was, there were proposals of putting uh, an extra tax on, um, plastic bottles or put in uh, an extra tax on uh, products that contain on sweets, on, the, uh, on snacks. And there was immediately a very strong uh, mm, 
uprising of all the companies that were producing plastic bottles and uh, snacks saying what this will kill our industry or will make our industry less competitive both in in Italy and in our export and so these uh, these taxes were removed. So it is very difficult to raise taxes. What you do, you raise public debt, and then you say, well, somehow we can pay this uh, public debt. So, but this just to point that we have a uh, we have constitutional provisions. Just to mention one, I mean Italian Constitution, Article 81. This means that uh, when the budget is voted and the budget is voted every year for the following year, it must be in balance. And in order to, um, to have it in balance, there must be revenue, which is expected from taxes, or you issue uh, ways of, uh, of public debt, mostly treasury bonds. What you do, you sell uh, bonds, you say you promise you will pay money back and you therefore you uh, you borrow money from the general public, from, from, uh, from savers in your own country, from foreign investors, and you say, well, I will, um, uh, if you give me uh, 1,000 euros, I will, in 25 years, I will give you an average 2%, 3%, whatever it is, uh, for uh, every year, I will give you over those 1,000 euros. Generally, it's not 1,000 euros, it's 1 million, 10 million, or 100 million. It's a very big amount to cover what are the expenses. So just to point out that, um, that public debt is essential, especially in those countries where there is uh, um, this balanced budget, because this means that you must all the time, for each expense you are put in, you are tagging, you're putting an item, you're putting in the, in the budget, uh, it can be uh, unemployment subsidies, it may be investment for infrastructures, uh, uh, bridge collapses, or there is, uh, uh, there's been an earthquake and so on. Well, you must find the money which is, uh, comes or from taxes or from uh, public debt. And as you see, this brings up, raises constitutional issues. Um, again, I just like to point out these constitutional issues as a very interesting case, which is, goes back to 2009. And there's this decision by the um, the German constitutional court is so-called Lissabon Vertrag decision. Uh, Lissabon is the German name for Lisbon. Um, uh, and the Lisbon Treaty is the Lisbon Treaty of the European Union. So what did the, what is the, what is the issue? The issue is, can the European Union um, somehow impose on the member states of the European Union certain expenditures in order to solve uh, economic crisis or not. Now this issue, 2009, is of, of enormous importance in these days because everybody's asking themselves how uh, in Europe are we going to recover from this dramatic uh, economic crisis and who is going to put the money in it. So, I'm just mentioning this uh, decision by the Constitutional Court, German Constitutional Court, because it's a very complex decision, very, very, um, very long. It's about 150 pages long. It's also in English. So those who are, even if you're not fluent in Germany, in German, you can go on the, on the, um, on the website of the German Constitutional Court and you will find it in, in English. And it is very interesting because it tells the whole idea is that uh, when it comes to taxes, well, uh, if you have to increase public expenditure through public debt, well, you need, this needs to be authorized by the German Parliament. So it goes back 
to all those things that we saw, Magna Carta, Thomas Hobbes, um, the, um, the Bill of Rights of 1689, the whole idea that the sovereignty of the nation is expressed through control over taxes and nobody else from outside can decide how much you are going to spend or not. So this has to do very much with obviously with sovereignty, which is a political notion, but then it meets, it encounters constitutional provisions. In this case, the German, uh, the whole, this whole decision of the German Constitutional Court is based on the notion of sovereignty and of democratic control over what the decisions are taken. And so these decisions on how much to spend cannot be taken outside Germany. They have to be, that is, by the European uh, Union institutions. They must be taken by the German people. That is the German parliament. Just to show you that the issue of public debt is, which is central today, but it was central also in the past, but even more central today, is bring raises very important constitutional issues, which, and obviously we want to compare, when we compare systems and we try to understand these, uh, how systems work, well, we have to see if there are constitutional constraints or not. Again, I just like to point out to show you how important this issue of public debt is uh, in relation to constitutional issues. In 1944, the Second World War wasn't yet finished, but the United Nations had been created, and the United Nations was already thinking of how to reconstruct the not only uh, the world, uh, democracy of the world, but also how to reconstruct uh, the economy of the world. And there were two institutions that were created in uh, this place in New England. This. Bretton Woods, I think it's New Hampshire, uh, which is uh, north, uh, northeastern US on the Atlantic, towards the Atlantic. Um, there were these two institutions which still exist. One is the International Monetary Fund, another is the World Bank. Now, what is interesting, and this is something which concerns us again, I mean, all of the whole of Europe, because generally these, these, um, these institutions have been working for developing countries, mostly, not only. Um, the International Monetary Fund is uh, what are its goals, promote global monetary cooperation, secure financial stability, facilitate international trade, promote high employment and sustainable economic growth, reduce poverty around the world. Wonderful things, we all agreement, nobody, nobody can say that they are against this, except I'm say, well, I don't want international trade, but if you're not against international trade, well, you think, generally one thinks that these are very good objectives. So how does the IMF work? It generally provides short-term financial resources to the members of the IMF in order to correct payment imbalances. What is a payment imbalance? Mostly when you have, you have to import much more than you have to export. So what happens is that you are getting poorer and poorer because you're spending all your money, you're spending it to buy things you need. Now, this is the, what happens uh, quite ordinary with developing, with developing countries who are, just think of poor um, developing countries of the third world who, are, who do not produce very much or maximum they have a little bit of agricultural activity and they are um, and they have to import a whole lot of, of uh, products so um, well uh, so they have a balance in pay they have to they send lots of money outside to buy uh, equipment to buy other um, uh, uh, expensive uh, products and they instead they 
export very little and therefore they receive very little. Now this is what already happened. Sometimes instead, it's not only developing countries that find themselves in difficulty, but also developed countries. And so what does the IMF ask for reform of fiscal systems and economic policy as condition to receive financial aid? So what does the IMF say? You need money, okay, that's fine. You, we give you money, we give you uh, 1 billion, 10 billion uh, dollars, well, no problem, we'll give them, but, 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 your, why are your, uh, you are so much in debt? Because your fiscal system doesn't work, because your social uh, system is too expensive. You have, uh, you pay too much in uh, old age pensions and so on. So the IMF says, I will give you money, but you must reform your system. And this is seen and has seen and very practically has been seen as an external intervention by an uh, international organization, although it is under the umbrella of the United Nations, on which limits constitutional prerogatives. And we see this is constantly when there was this Greek crisis um, about five, six years ago, this was the main opposition of Greece was saying that with the IMF, an international organization, is telling us Greek citizens how we must organize our fiscal system and how we must organize our social services and the uh, kind of uh, um, uh, pension system and so on. So just to point out that this is seen uh, in a global world, in a very uh, in a world where no country can live by itself, where there are uh, uh, not only international political relations, but international economic and financial relations with the rest of the world, well, these kinds of interventions which are needed to keep a country going and to restart a country after a very severe economic crisis raise significant constitutional issues which have to be analyzed and taken into consideration. At least to us lawyers, constitutional issues are paramount. I mean, otherwise, if we are not lawyers, well, we can consider other aspects. But if we are lawyers, we have to consider constitutional issues as paramount. So just to point out that this, uh, this uh, problem of public debt is not only of how much taxes we pay as citizens or the amount of social services we receive or do not receive as citizens, but it's also uh, a problem of how we apply, we interpret the constitution and what we can do or we cannot do uh, with our constitutional system. So just to, this, just to show you that uh, when we're talking of taxation, we go, we, we're not only talking of, you know, VAT, uh, how much, uh, how much VAT we are paying on 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 certain products, or or how much uh, only on how much uh, um, what is the income uh, tax that every citizen is paying or should be paying on his or her uh, income. It it has raises much more complex issues. Now, um, I just. Stop here for on the asking you if there are questions. On this, on these, um, this part devoted to taxation. Oh, what does Bretton Woods has to do with taxation? Okay, uh, Panji. Uh, Bretton Woods is uh, the, this town in New Hampshire where the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank were established. Um, when, uh, uh, as I've mentioned, um, the IMF is uh, this international financial institution that grants 
uh, financial resources to countries which are in difficulty and do not have enough money to restart the economic system and to pay back their, uh, their debts. Um, as I've mentioned, and I think the Greek case, because it's a country very near to us and it's, uh, well, it happened in Greece and I don't say um, it uh, does, it won't happen to us in Italy, but it could happen, this is a concern. When the Greece found itself unable to repay its debts and with a very strong um, economic crisis, uh, you may remember some of you that at a certain point in Greece, nobody could, could withdraw money from the bank. You could withdraw up to 200 euros per week from the bank. So the whole system was blocked to avoid from people um, getting, um, withdrawing all their money from the banks, which were euros, and bringing them to countries where other euro countries. So what happens when the IMF intervenes, uh, it generally asks for fiscal reform. It says, listen, you have a huge debt. You will never be able to repay this debt, and you won't be able to repay the debt you are taking you because the IMF doesn't hand out money. It lends money at a limited, at a low rate, but it lends money. That money must come back. So it says, I will give you one billion, ten billion dollars, but if I want to be sure you're going to repay this, and how are you going to repay this? You're going to repay through taxes. So the IMF says you have to change your taxation system. For example, your taxation system doesn't work well. It doesn't, you don't, uh, uh, it is too low. You are, for example, on companies, the taxes are too low or on wealth, you should put a tax on wealth because you have people who have lots of money of, of, of estate. They have houses, they have boats, they have uh, uh, valuable assets. And therefore, you, you must pay, you must set not only taxes on, uh, on income, so what you earn, but also on what you have, you already have, so on wealth. So this has very much, the IMF has very much to do with taxation system. And constantly, wherever it puts money, it says, I want reforms in your tax system. So uh, if we, if we, countries who are mostly strict by uh, being struck by this economic crisis with the coronavirus uh, pandemic, uh, let's imagine Italy and Spain, but also France, uh, we go to the IMF and say we need money, the IMF will say yes, okay, I will lend you money, but in order to lend you this money, you must change uh, your some aspects of your of your fiscal of your fiscal system, and so we start saying, "Hey, but we this has to do with uh, with the citizens' right to change it." You IMF, you cannot force us to change these uh, uh, these uh, rules in taxation. And so the IMF will say, "Oh no, problem! You go to Parliament, get this uh, voted by Parliament, and if the Parliament votes it, I'll give you the money. If the Parliament doesn't vote." this reform, well, I won't give you the money. So as you see, it's not something that is irrelevant. Bretton Woods has very much to do with taxation system and with social security and with social services. Very much to do, especially now, with many European countries, we are in a dramatic economic crisis. Now, um, main benefits of flat tax. Uh, um, Salvatici. Uh, now, I, I think that none of us, myself, not myself, not in the class, we don't have enormous amount of money. We don't earn a firm. We don't earn a successful firm. Or if we, um, own, we don't own a successful firm. And if we uh, were, uh, had a successful firm, now we would be in difficulty. But let's imagine you have a very successful firm 
uh, and you're making profits. You're making good profits. And these profits are the result of your work. It isn't that you're sort of, you're giving work to lots of people, you're working 16 hours a day, you have selected very good um, employees, uh, people who are assistants and so on. And you're making money and you say, making money and for each euro, you realize that for each euro, you 60 cents go in taxes of various kinds. And you say, hey, I'm doing all this. I'm working 16 hours a day. I'm giving work to 1,000 people, so on. And all this goes in taxes. Where's the profit? Where, what is the sense of this? So you not really, you don't have a strong incentive to, to increase your profits. Now, just keep in mind, in a capitalistic society, which starts more or less, as I've mentioned, in the Middle Ages, well, companies are made for profit. They're not made for, uh, for charities. If you want to do a charity, you do something different. Very good charities are very noble activity, but you don't set up a company. A company is there to make profit. So um, you are... Um, you don't have a very strong, you don't have an incentive to have, uh, uh, to make more profits. What you try to do, you try to go in a country where you pay less taxes. So this is fiscal competition. Flat taxes are a way of attracting foreign companies and to encourage companies that are already in your, uh, under your jurisdiction to develop themselves to become important economic players and to make more profits. Now, obviously, we can have, uh, and it is, this is a debate that has been going on, anybody of you who has, uh, um, knows about the Gospels, you know, this whole debate in the Gospels of, of what you do with your money, if you make money, profit or not. So I'm not going to enter in this theological issue, but just to point out, it is a very, very profound issue, the problem of profit and how you should make profit and so on. But in our contemporary econo economies, well, surely if someone, if your neighbor is making much more profit than yourself, and the instrument that the, your neighbor is making profit with is a flat tax, you've realized that you're losing a lose competition because your the main companies that are in your country will go to that, your neighbor, neighboring country because they pay less taxes and they have an incentive to have, make more profit. So just to point out that this is, um, the main benefit of flat tax is that of increasing profitability of companies. Go back to the uh, go back to the slides we saw on companies and how companies are financed. Obviously, if a company has lots of profits in the Rhine model, it doesn't have to go to the bank to ask for money, and therefore is much freer. And if it works in the Anglo-American system, obviously, if it has lots of profits shareholders will buy and say wonderful let's buy let's buy uh the um, uh, shares of the salvatici incorporated because it gives a very good dividend and so that the, this company says well i have more money more people are asking for these shares i will issue more shares and then i will buy also some other um uh, some other um, some other companies and make more profit so you see that the the issue of flat of flat taxes, paying less taxes, is that uh, um, we can value have diff very different, quite legitimate views from ethical from an ethical point of view on uh, how much taxes should be paid. But if we look at the reality of the economics, we see that companies which are not bad companies, they're just reason in, in function of profit because they must make profit shareholders, well, they, they the reason where they pay less taxes. Now, uh, are the only, what is a pro-cyclic and anti-cyclic approach mean? Let's, I'll try to uh, explain it better. Uh, in a pro-cyclic, uh, I'm talking of pro-cyclic and anti-cyclic from the uh, point of view of state expenditure. You could also apply it to the banking system. Uh, Let's see if I can explain it through the banking system. 
uh, we are in uh, economic crisis. Suddenly, at a certain point on the sort of, let's hope, on the 1st of June, everything starts again. Um, so all our key economic activities start again, uh, industries restart, restaurants, bars, and so on. They have remained closed for March, May, uh, April, May, three months. They've made no money. They need money because they must start again. They must buy. They have made no profits. They've spent all the few money they had aside. The owners of the uh, of the restaurant, of the cafes, they have they have no money. Enterprises they've spent everything. They haven't worked for three months, and so they have no money. They go to the bank and say, listen, I need money to start again. The bank says, hey, yes, but what guarantees can you tell me? What, have you, what are your profits? I say, sorry very much, I have no profits. You know very well, I haven't been, my, my business has been closed for three months. I've made no profits. Oh, well, then we can't give you much money. Now, that is a pro-cyclic approach. There is a financial difficulty, and those who want should lend money are very, very uh, cautious in lending money to people who have no money. Because you say, well, when is this person going to repay me? So that is a pro-cyclic. And this has a pro-cyclic approach, has a typical uh, spiral. It means that uh, this industry would like, business would like to start again, but doesn't find enough uh, petrol to go ahead, fuel to, financial fuel to go ahead and therefore it uh, it uh, it doesn't can't start because there's no fuel only very few drops and so very financial drops and so it can start very slowly an anti cyclic cyclic approach is saying hey we have this crisis well we must throw money on the market what is called it's a, this expression which has been used in the US. As you know, the US has all these very colorful expressions. Helicopter money. The idea that there's a helicopter that goes around and throws money, there's someone who throws money, generally the central bank that throws money on the people that are underneath. Doesn't matter where they come, you know that people will get that money and they're going to spend it. And the whole economic system is going to restart. Just think. After, in the 1st of June, bars, coffee, uh, cafes, restaurants, shops, they all open, but we have no money. Why? Because what we had in savings, we didn't, we didn't make any money in these three months, we spent everything. So what can we buy? You can't buy anything. The helicopter passes over Rome, over whatever it is, over, over, over Liege or over London or, or Warwick, and just as helicopter throws money and says, who gets the money then will go and spend it. The whole economy will start again. Now this is an anti-cyclic approach saying when there is an economic crisis, the role of financial, public financial institutions must be that of making money available. Because if you don't make money available, this economic crisis will wrap up and will wind and wind and wind and will get worse and worse. So this, uh, just to show you, that these are, I mean, if you look at the, if you try to understand what is the, the debate on the, this, uh, this how, to, how we're going to get out of the economic crisis we are today, well, one of the issues is that of helicopter money, that of the, the, uh, the substantially, the state will, the state, the public institutions will print money and hand out money to whoever needs that money. And all countries are doing like this, saying, well, when you when you will start be able to start your activity again we'll give you money 25000 euros 250 euros 250000 2 million and a half euros we'll give this money and the state will guarantee well if you repay it, you repay it. otherwise the state will pay for this and so this is an anti cyclic system by which you uh, you somehow try to put the economy back into function instead of saying oh but I'm, the state says, oh, I'm not going to receive any money. Nobody's going to pay taxes this year. And therefore, I must be very, very careful when I hand out money because I spend money, I must cut on everything. Instead, the anti-cyclic means I'm going to go, there's an economic crisis, I'm going to spend a lot. There's very good 
high profits, a fair economy goes fine. Well, I can be do I can do little expenditure because the system is going on by itself. Now, um, some Marco is asking. Um, I didn't quite understand how the Lisbon Treaty changed the role of parliaments in the European Union. Now, uh, the Lisbon Treaty you will study this in significantly when you study EU law, um, has substantially changed, has given more power to the uh, European Union Council, that is the heads of state uh, and of government of the European Union, of the 27 member states, of the Commission and of the European Parliament, and incidentally also of the European Central Bank. Uh, these powers are not only in uh, um, deciding what should be uh, done or not done uh, policies in the field of, let's imagine, energy or transport, or, but also powers in the, what is the European budget. European Union is a very many institutions has a budget and it gets its budget from the member states and it spends it in a certain way. And the whole idea is that it, when there is uh, somehow some kind of crisis in the uh, financial crisis in the European Union, the European Union should intervene and somehow solve these economic, um, uh, these, uh, uh, these economic uh, crises. Now, what did the Germans say in their decision? What did the German Constitutional Court say in this decision? Something that, uh, as I've mentioned, is something that dates back to Magna Carta, to Thomas Hobbes and the social contract, to the Bill of Rights of 1689. The whole idea is that taxation is the basic principle of sovereignty and today, in our times, in our modern times, basic element of democracy. Only, only the citizens have to decide what is the level of taxation. If it is up to the citizens, the citizens vote, and what, who do they vote for? They vote for their own parliament. And so it is the national parliament that has to decide how much taxes, where do these taxes go, and how must this money be spent. And therefore, no external institution, the European Union, can tell Germany, and therefore the German people, how they're going to, uh, how much taxes they're going to pay, how much debt they're going to do, and where this money is going to go. Just as a problem of, uh, if you look at this decision, it's it's interesting. From from, I mean, you will find an enormous amount of debate in favour or against, but that's not as usual. I mean, the law is nice because we have various uh, various different ideas on the law, on the, on, the, on the merits. But what is interesting is the point that bases it on the democratic theory. It is up to the citizens to establish the level of taxation, the level of public debt, and how this uh, expenditure, public expenditure, should go. And therefore, so this is uh, why and this decision taken by the German Constitutional Court has been followed by other constitutional courts in other countries, in other European countries, which have said these constitutional courts have said, "Hey, now, listen, uh, European Union is fine. That's fine. It's, it's okay. But when it comes to these aspects, this is up to national sovereignty and to democratic control over uh, public expenditure." So, just to point out that this is. This is just to show you the, how important our constitutional issues are when we're talking about taxation. Um, Chad Badi. Uh, I didn't understand the aggressive effect of flat taxes. Um, could you repeat it, please? Uh, well, obviously, you must compare this with progressive taxes. Let's take an example. We have company A that makes, let's make, it makes 1 million euros of profits uh, a year. And company B, which is established, let's say it's established in Sweden. Let's take a typical, not, not in Sweden, country where everything apparently, well, well, social system works and so on. And in Sweden, that company has a, uh, 
progressive, uh, a progressive um, uh, tax rate on company profits, which makes the pay, let's say, over one up to when it's one million over one million, fifty percent. So this means that five hundred thousand euros of those profits go to the state and will be spent by the state, whatever how that state wants to spend. Let's take another country. Let's take Latvia, one of the Baltic republics, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. Latvia has a flat tax, I think, more or less around 25%. Company B is based in Latvia and has a profit of 1 uh, million euros. The Latvian government applies flat tax and says 25 only 25, uh, you will pay me only 25%, that is 250,000 euros. Now, what does this mean? It means that in Sweden, uh, the state has received from company A and all the companies that are in the same situation, a very much higher amount of, of, um, of, uh, of taxes and therefore can pay for, uh, for social services and for government expenditure with that money that has, been, um, that has been collected from those who pay most. If you don't get this money from those who get pay most, you will have to get it from somewhere else, from those who get less. So companies which have earned much less than a certain amount, will obviously have to pay more and individuals have to pay more. So the whole idea is that uh, the, the main challenge against flat taxes is at the end of the day, those who have less in proportion, the, the rate is always the same, but if you look at their, uh, at their own income, especially if they're individual or small enterprises, that is very, very much expensive for them. So if you talk about, 10,000 euros for a small business, 10,000 euros is a lot. 10,000 euros for a, a big company, well, it's nothing, 10,000 euros. So this is why it is felt as having a regressive, um, uh, a regressive uh, effect because it shifts the, um, the burden of taxation on those, more on those who pay, uh, who have lower incomes, rather than those who have higher incomes. Now, obviously, there are very good arguments. And if you go and look at the debate, you will find very heated debate. And those who say, yes, flat tax is the solution. And those who say, no, flat tax is very bad and has very negative social effects. So uh, this is uh, uh, just to point out that, the, and it rather depends also on the kind of economy. What is your economy? What is the, what is the, economic system, what kind of enterprises do you have? Are they mostly engaged in, in domestic production or are they mostly mm, uh, engaged in other uh, kinds of activities, financial activities or industrial? Are you doing produ production or services? So this has very much to do, it's not uh, the reply, uh, whether flat taxes or progressive taxes, the reply is never easy because you must look at country by country and try to understand whether certain model would be more or less functional in that in that system or would it work only for certain enterprises just think of um uh, financial sector in the luxembourg well there you have um substantially very low taxes and substantial nearly flat taxes and well that is very good for that sector it develops that sector while if you have a different kind of activity well it's different and you will have a progressive um a progressive tax so you must have to look at country by country and this is why we want to compare countries but we must compare them from a constitutional point of view can you introduce um flat taxes or not because if the constitution says that taxes must be progressive, you cannot have flat taxes. You have to try to understand what is the economy in that, uh, in that country, how is the structure of the economy, agriculture, production, in the industry, or services, and what kind of services, financial services, 
or digital services, which is a very important aspect. So you have to try to understand what is the good mix of uh, uh, in taxation system. Now, uh, are there alternatives to a country that should would use the IMF but uh, does not want to reform? No, no. There's no uh, very difficult to find uh, this kind of solution. The IMF is very. As a matter of fact, what happened was that the IMF uh, um, said, I will lend money to Greece, but Greece must introduce certain limitations. Greece said, no, I will not introduce those limitations. So the European Union stepped in and said, listen, IMF, listen, I guarantee for Greece, I can assure you that Greece will somehow recover and will repay that. And it did. What is very interesting to say, nobody trusted and it was sort of, there was a government which was mostly left-wing government, therefore strongly opposed from an ideological point of view to, uh, to, um, to the IMF, the Tsipras government, which was extreme left-wing uh, movement and the minister of, uh, of uh, the economy, Varoufakis, again, was very strong uh, critique, critic, very critical towards IMF. The, the European Union stepped in and said to IMF, don't worry, I will see that things go well. And things actually have been going well. Greece has repaid its debt. And so though all those who were mistrusting Greece and say, oh, Greece will never repay its debt. This is just money down the rabbit hole. Well, instead, we look at the, if you look at the IMF uh, uh, sort of reports on Greece, well, it gradually had, has uh, repaid most of its debt. Not that the situation is uh, now a difficult situation for everybody, but just to show you that uh, in this case, uh, the, and this is probably what will happen uh, also after when we come out of the uh, pandemic, what the IMF will give money to certain European countries which are most in need, and the uh, European Union will somehow guarantee for your repayment of that money. We have to try to understand what are, what kind of guarantees will be asked to member states. Now, um, in the slide about IT, what did you say about the country's uh, use of public debt? Well, obviously, uh, we'll see it in a moment how, why certain countries have a very high public debt. I just mentioned, just to make a difference, but the US is not, I mean, you could apply this, obviously you apply this to Israel, which is in a similar situation. Obviously, uh, but let's take, let's take more reasonably the US. The US as a superpower needs all uh, very strong military uh, deployment. It must be present in all seas, in all skies. It must be always present and therefore it spends trillions, not millions, trillions in, so the money goes there. In Europe, where we are more peaceful, hopefully, uh, well, we, we tend to spend lots of money in other in social services, but we shall see this in, we shall see this in, um, in um, we shall see it, this in the next, uh, in the next uh, uh, module devoted to social services in comparison between uh, US and Europe. Uh, just to point out that this is the, uh, the so when you do what you do with public debt, uh, obviously it's also a choice. I mean, obviously Congress when uh, it's not only is it well Democrats try to cut a little bit on on military expenses. Trump obviously not, uh, but this is a tradition. I mean. Uh, Republicans are more in favor of certain expenses and uh, Democrats are more in favor of other expenses. But uh, this has to do with how American voters decide and what is the administration. Again, we're talking of democratic system. Let me bring this back to it. And this is why the Lisbon Vertrag decision is so important because it points out that at the end of the day, it has to do citizens decide what kind, how monies should be collected and how they should be spent. Uh, obviously with a certain amount of flexibility by governments, which sh surely cannot um, change everything overnight and say, oh no, we are not going to pay these services any longer. But uh, when it comes to budget session, we see very clearly what is the kind of 
majority, whatever country, whether we're talking of Germany, Spain, Italy, or the UK, we see how the money, where the money, where the money goes. Now, um, just, I won't go much, it's half past five, um, just, uh, um, let's go, just to point out that um, you've seen what happens when this video, how you must be dressed when you're busy, you have a video, and then I just wanted to show you something another slide which is maybe useful for everybody let me see if i can find it if i find it i'll show it to you Yeah, just I hope you can see this and I hope you you appreciate this. So as this I know many people have a, a problem with the with the barber or the hairdresser. Well just to give you it's not a problem that concerns only us in Italy, but it concerns the whole whole world which has lockdown. Um, Okay, now let's close this and let's go back to our slides. If I can find my slides, now oh, one second, just let me, let me just get them here. Here they are. Now, just I just want you to start. Then we tomorrow we'll go more in depth, uh, depth uh, uh, on this issue. Uh, we've seen the, the module. This module is devoted to welfare state, and so we've seen more or less the issue of how uh, the sort of welfare state is financed, and we see it is financed mostly through taxation and public debt. Now. What we are interested in, we've seen that the welfare state has been developing over these last uh, uh, two centuries and mostly after uh, in the 20th century. Um, well, uh, what we want to do is compare legal systems on the basis of the social services they provide to citizens. Now, this is uh, very important because, I mean, when we sort of, we compare we are lawyers, and so we tend to look at norms. But let's look at the quality of life. What kind of, uh, of quality of life do citizens have in one country rather than a different country? Just let's avoid uh, references to um, daily dramatic issues that we find today. And I've mentioned this several times. University education in the UK, uh, Wood and uh, Kid, who are online, I think they pay more or less nine thousand pounds per uh, per year for their university university uh, tuition fees, unless obviously they have some grants. And so, in Italy, uh, those who have to pay full, uh, you among students of Roma Tre uh, of this class. Well, unless you have some kind of 
uh, subsidy or reduction, dependent, this can several students have, but others don't. Well, it's 1,000 and something, 1,200, something like that, 1,400 uh, um, pay. Um, German students who are um, in students who are in Germany don't pay uh, don't pay anything. Students that are in Scotland don't pay anything for university uh, education. So just to point out, just to see, we when we are comparing, we are interested to understand uh, sort of what is the standard of life, how the law in the field of welfare state changes more or less uh, the standard of living of citizens because. On the whole, democracy, this is democracy. Democracy is leaving citizens aside more or less what they should do and not only on very important issues, you know, uh, freedom of religion, uh, freedom of expression, uh, freedom of, of uh, association, you know, these basic principles that are uh, of first, uh, first generation fundamental rights. But here we're looking at very, very important aspects which to which most citizens are more interested. They want to know what what extent uh, our democratic systems are able to provide these services. Maybe they say, I don't care so much about freedom of expression, freedom of religion, I don't have I don't care about this or that, but I want to have social services. This is important. I mentioned this approach just to point out that uh, we have, uh, um, but we can't analyze it here, but I just want to mention this to you. Uh, we have this so-called output democracies in which the problem is not so much uh, what, uh, you know, what people do and what, how they vote and so on. What we are interested in, though, we are interested in what the, it provides. Let's see what are the services, the quality of the services it provides. Let's look at the output, not the input. Input is voting. Okay, that's fine. I'm mostly, con I will be concentrated on output. So just to point out that when I'm talking about this, it's not, so we cannot, uh, we cannot think that democracy is only a great ideal, idealistic, ideological debates, very important, fundamental, and so on. It has to do with this also with very practical needs of population and voters decide also on how they vote on the basis of what the, uh, these basic needs are, uh, uh, taken care uh, of, and uh, and so obviously we're talking of social services. So this is when we compare. We are interested in comparing what is the social services which are provided. And the first issue I want to point to you is: should they be provided only to citizens, those those who have the citizenship of a certain country? In Italy, only Italians. In the uh, UK, there's been significant debate, who should have health care? Also, people who are not British and um, should they receive uh, social services? Well, this is a very heated debate, uh, political debate. And we were talking of citizens, all citizens or only those who have a low income? Now, this also has a problem of redistribution. Now, these are very political issues but also legal issues, because you have to frame them from a legal point of view. When you start saying, for example, immigrants should not receive certain services or should receive only certain basic services. Should they receive educational services, health services? Oh, one says, yes. Should they receive uh, certain benefits, unemployment service uh, uh, benefits? And, People say, no, why should they receive unemployment uh, uh, benefits? So just to point out that this issue is a very hot social and political issue, but it has to be dressed up in legal um, uh, clothes and the issue of principle of non-discrimination, of fair treatment, uh, and so on. So of equal 
quality. So just to point out that we are bringing up, uh, we are talking about social services and again we're talking of fundamental principles of our constitutional orders. And just to list, I mean, once upon a time in, in when it starts in Prussia and in, in Austria, as well, as social services is health and education. Now we see health education, basic income. Now this is a great debate as to not only in Italy, so-called reddito di cittadinanza, which is basic income, but we find in many other European countries something similar to that, unemployment subsidies, uh, old age pensions, energy supply, the fact that you pay, don't pay, uh, you pay uh, very little for your energy in electricity or natural gas, transport services, people, uh, let's say over 65, pay, uh, don't pay for transport or pay reduced, or students pay uh, a reduced amount for transport services, telecommunication services, so just to point out, when we start making the list of what we feel are social services, we see these are very uh, increasing. And all the time, we feel, they sh we feel this is necessary for a state to provide these kinds of services. Now, I will stop here. I will not, tomorrow, we shall um, go further on the uh, topic of uh, uh, social, uh, social services, because again, this is very much related to the welfare state, obviously, but it has to do with comparative legal systems because we will have to compare the European model with the US model and trying to see why these two countries, which are so similar for certain, under certain aspects, are so different under this particular aspect of uh, social services. So we have to try to compare and understand what are the differences and what are also the similarities. But I would uh, for this afternoon, I will stop here and, and ask you if you have uh, any questions uh, for concerning um, concerning today's uh, lesson. Uh, and then further on uh, during the day, I will be sending you an email uh, with further information on the course, on the class. And so you will re be receiving uh, try to give you a, a detailed um, information on on what on the next steps of our course. Uh, kid, to everyone, no. Um...